Hey, Jim Hoffman here for EMS Office Hours, and this is your Monday Minutes. Okay, guys, today I thought it would be a good idea to just sort of go over uh, the differences between two triad, triads or triads that we see here in EMS, and uh, it can get confusing, okay, especially if you're new in the field, you haven't been exposed to these signs and symptoms before, but you've heard these uh, terms, and, you know, you kind of get confused of which one applies where, and the terms I'm talking about is Beck's triad and Cushing's triad. Now, the thing is that sometimes you might even get Cushing's triad referred to as a Cushing's reflex, um, and, you know, it might make it a little bit easier maybe to remember it that way, but I want to go over the two of them because they both sort of uh, affect the cardiac output and what you're going to see as far as blood pressure and things like that. So um, let's just real quick, I'm going to go over each one and hopefully uh, this will be a good takeaway for you and you'll be able to just pop these in your head the next time you have a patient presenting with these signs and symptoms. So Beck's triad is actually a... Uh, uh, three medical signs you're going to see, and this is usually going to be associated with a uh, cardiac tamponade. And you know, this is really an emergency, of course, and this is a real true emergency cardiac tamponade. And this is where you're getting a lot of blood; it's accumulating um, around the heart. It could also just be fluid of some type as well that's going around the heart. And what happens is it impairs the heart's ability, of course, to pump blood because it's got fluid accumulating around it, right? So what you're going to see in the triad you're going to see is a drop in the blood pressure, uh, JVD or that jugular venous distension you're going to see, the distended neck veins, and you're going to hear distant or a uh, muffled heart sound. So what happens is this fall in the blood pressure, the first part, and this is, again, it's resulting from that pericardial fluid accumulation and it gets to that point where it impairs the ability for the heart to stretch, inducing the stroke volume and the cardiac output. And of course, this is the two major things that, that winds up determining the patient's systolic blood pressure, right? The stroke volume and, and the cardiac output. So that's the uh, one part there. And the second part, the JVD or the the uh, distended neck veins, um, usually you're going to see this when the patient is not going to be in a supine position. So you, you'll be able to see it when they're sitting up. And um, this is often caused by the reduced diastolic filling of the right ventricle. Okay, and then this pressure that's getting exerted, um, you know, by the that pericardial sac, of course, that, that's expanding because of the fluid, gets that back up of the fluid into the veins, and then they drain to the heart, and then most most of the time you're going to see this in the patient in that JVD. Okay, the only thing to mention though, if you have a patient whose blood pressure really is dropping significantly, you kind of like, a, I guess, down the line of the Beck's triad or, the, or that cardiac tamponade, the, the, name, the, the neck veins may not be distended because the blood pressure is so low. Okay, and then your heart sounds, of course, you're going to have that muffling effect uh, passing through the heart because of the fluid, right? So, you know, the, the sounds are going to be muffled because of that fluid that's around the heart. So that's Bex, okay? So that's um, pretty clear cut, right? Cardiac tamponade, um, that's the main issue of Bex and the three things you're going to see there. Now, Cushing's triad, now this is another set of three primary signs that you're going to see and usually this is due to an increase in intracranial uh, pressure or ICP and those three signs are going to be a chain respirations uh, usually that irregular and deep uh, type of respiration something like uh, chain stokes type of respiratory pattern um, you can get that widening pulse pressure with these patients where we're talking about a increase in the patient's systolic blood pressure rather than a decrease, okay? That's a, this should be a tip for you to be able to tell the difference between the two. And you're going to have that differencing between the diastolic and the systolic. So what it is with Cushing's is you're going to have that elevated systolic blood pressure, but you're going to have either a decreased or a normal diastolic blood pressure.
blood pressure. And the patient's going to be bradycardic. So you might have, let's say, a trauma patient where you're going to expect them, let's say, to be um, tachycardic, right, because it's a trauma-type patient. But when you take their vital signs, you see that they have a... Uh, you know, they're very hypertensive, um, the breathing rate's a little erratic, and you're going to find them to be bradycardia and, you know, should leave it to, lead you to believe the patient's having a major type of, uh, uh, you know, a neurological event happening here. Now, this signs, though, again, these are late signs. You might not always see them all together. You might initially just see the blood pressure uh, increasing uh, the older mental status or unresponsiveness. Um, but these are things that us as paramedics in the field, we have to kind of really be on the lookout for when we see patients that have a recent head injury, let's say um, maybe some type of even recent neurosurgery or patients that have sort of like an, a sudden altered level of consciousness that we really just can't point to a a, a reason why. Okay, think about that, you know, keep an eye out for this uh, Cushing's triad to be going on. So it is important, like I mentioned, especially for us, because it does suggest that pressure inside, you know, the brain that's going on inside that cranial vault and, you know, that bleeding inside the cerebral, you know, cerebral hemorrhage going on. Um, and other things you can think about as well to, for that altered mental status uh, beyond head injury are things like, let's say, a hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, maybe even something uh, um, like a uh, an aneurysm. Okay, um, and the bleeding can be whether it it could be subdural or epidural in nature. Um, so just keep that in mind, guys. That it might not always be a result of trauma. It could also be a result of other things as well. And again, this is a more of a late sign, uh, but we have to keep an eye out for it to becoming evolving when we with these types of patients okay uh, so that's pretty much it guys pretty simple right pretty easily uh, kind of differentiating the three symptoms the three primary little uh, signs you're going to see for the Bex and Cushing's triad okay so uh, I think that once you see a brain injury patient that has those three you're not going to forget it and the same thing goes for the cardiac tamponade once you've got a patient that has that and you see those signs you're not going to forget it. So if you've seen this stuff in the past, guys, and, uh, you know, maybe this can maybe hopefully help you sort of uh, give yourself a little refresher on these two different uh, signs and symptoms, okay? One mention I want to do on the Cushing's, though, guys, don't get it confused with Cushing's syndrome, okay? This is a disease all right, of a patient, and it's from a result of elevated levels of blood cortisol all right so two different things entirely just throwing that out there maybe next monday minutes i'll go ahead and talk about cushion syndrome a little bit and get that or maybe a little bit more clarified for you as well all right listen i hope you can use these monday minutes um if you have some minutes of your own be sure to send them over to me my email direct is jhoffman at ems safety.com and until next week and next monday guys as always jim hoffman stay safe